We're in Acts chapter 10 and the first part of chapter 11, and we're going to look at the interesting meeting of Peter with Cornelius. I'm going to read through this text. It's rather lengthy, and, um, but we'll be pausing in between to make some observations as we go. So here we go at the beginning of Acts chapter 10. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. Now let's just review for ourselves what we have learned about Cornelius to this point. He is not a Jew. He is a Roman citizen. He is apparently not a proselyte. He's not a convert to Judaism. The text never indicates that. But he is a devout, God-fearing man. He is generous, and he prays regularly. And this offering of his life, the good deeds that he does, his prayer, his devotion to God, he is told has been received by God as an offering. And so he has this vision of this angel from God. And I think it's fair to say, and we'll see this as we go on in this account, that Cornelius is a very humble man. He has a very exalted position, we're told, as a Roman soldier. And, um, and, uh, and yet he's very obedient, and he listens to God, and he responds to God. Okay, let's go on in the text. Now uh, Peter is introduced. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers, remember he sends these messengers as the angel told him to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Now, is it surprising to you that God would tell Peter to do something that was clearly against his expressed word. It was clearly against the law, and Peter notices this, or Peter acknowledges this. So put yourself in Peter's position. You have this vision, this trance, which seemingly is from God, but in this vision, God, or whoever it is, is telling you to do something that is contrary to his word. And by word, I want, to, I want to emphasize that you'll frequently see the word of God referred to um, in, in the Bible. And of course, many times in the Old Testament as well, when you read in the Psalms, for example, Psalm 119, which talks all about the word, the law, the statutes. 
what is the word of God? Well, we've been kind of trained or programmed to think when something, when we hear the word of God, we think of the Bible. But of course, in the Old Testament, they did not have the Bible that we think of. There was the Old Testament scriptures, but people didn't have general access to them like they, we do now. When the phrase is used, the word of God, and this is frequently the case in the New Testament as well, it means something broader than just the pages between that and that binding that we call the Bible. Better it is to think of the word of God as the expressed will of God, as the expressed will of God. So that's why here I say what God seemingly in this vision is telling Peter to do is against his expressed will as he expressed it in the law. So you can imagine that, that if this happened to you, that you'd be perplexed, as the text is going to tell us that Peter was perplexed. Is this God speaking to me or isn't it? Why would God tell me to do something that is contrary to his word? Can you think of anywhere else in the scriptures where God seemingly told somebody to do something that was contrary to his word? Have you ever wondered about Abraham? And God telling Abraham to sacrifice his son? Now that's prior to giving to the, the law of Moses, which comes later. But certainly, I think it's fair to say that Abraham, although there were pagan religions around that Abraham must have been exposed to that did practice human sacrifice, that Abraham would have known that that is contrary to the nature of his God. And I've often thought if Abraham came to me and said, I, God has spoken to me and he said to offer my son as a sacrifice, I would have said to him, well, Abraham, surely that's not God. That's not God speaking to you because God would never tell you to do that. And if I was a devout Jew, as we're going to see later in this account, if I was a devout Jew and Peter came to me and said, God told me to do these things, God told me that these things are not unclean, I would say to him, well, that, that's not God. God is not going to go against his word. That must be a devil. That must be a demon. That must just be in your head. But here we have God telling Peter something that seems contrary to his expressed will and word. Okay, let's go on in the text. Peter was very perplexed at this. What could the vision mean? So he's assuming there's something deeper or bigger here than just eating animals. What could this vision mean? He's perplexed. Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them. Without hesitation, don't worry, for I have sent them. Now let's pause again at this point, and I know I feel like in the last several weeks I've reinforced this, but I feel like it needs reinforcing because we are in a culture that just as a culture denies these things. But what we see in this account is we see regarding God, what it reveals to us about God is God is not a force. God is real and he is personal and he's not off in some corner of the universe. He's aware of what's going on in this world and he's interacting with what goes on in this world. He's directing things to accomplish his purposes. 
He's speaking to people. He's giving visions to people. He's directing them. And what do we see about people and their relationship, their interaction with God in, these, in this account? They recognize when God is speaking to them. They hear him. They see him. They follow directions from him. Now, this does not mean that it always happens this way. But again, I just wanted to emphasize here that the, the, the basic revelation that we see even in this passage is, is so contrary to many of the expressions about God that we, that we find in our culture and that people make that we interact with, whom we interact with. Oh, God doesn't really exist. God is a force. I was just watching um, some Star Wars thing, you know, and it's always the force be with you, the force be with you, the force, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, a surrogate for God or the Holy Spirit, a Christian would say. But the force in Star Wars is not a personal God. It's just some kind of power, unusual power that can be drawn upon or wielded. wielded. And, 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 and we want to be careful and, and in our interactions with people. No, God is not a force. He is personal and he is near and he's interacting in this world. And of course, then the question is, as we think about that or we discuss that with people or God reveals that to us, the question is, God, how am I to know you? How am I to interact with you? Or how do you want to interact with me and want me to know you since you are a personal God who intervenes and who works in this world? Let's go on with the text. So Peter went down and said, these men had come, right, and they're asking for him. So Peter went down and said, I am the man you are looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the other brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now, I just want to remind you that at the beginning of this account, it says that not only Cornelius was a God-fearing man, but all of the people in his household. So his godliness... His devout relationship with God was not just for him alone, but he saw that as necessary and wonderful for all those who were in his household. And we see that indication here, too. He believed that God had a message for him to come to, to speak to him through this man, Peter, whom he didn't know. And in anticipation of the significance of this message, not only for Cornelius, but for everyone in his household, it says he called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. Now, let's just pause there again for a minute. And notice how different Peter's reaction is than Jesus' reaction when people fell at his feet and worshipped him. When Peter falls at Jesus' feet and says, You are Lord, you are my Lord and God. Does Jesus say to him, whoa, 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 stop. <laughs> no, I am just a man like you. 
No, when instances of similar to this happen with Jesus, he accepts the worship. He accepts the worship. So for, again, for a thoughtful person who says Jesus was just a teacher, a good teacher, another man, okay, you can say that if you want. If you're saying, what does the biblical text tell us about Jesus? Then I got some problems with that. If Jesus was just a man, then, then why did he accept worship? When Peter, for example, here, or we'll see later in Acts chapter 14, when Paul does a miracle and the same thing happens, the people want to worship him, they're very quick to say, stop. <laughs> we're, we're, that is inappropriate. Worship belongs only to God. Jesus accepts the worship, but Peter here says, stop it. We are just human beings, just like you. Okay, the text goes on. So they, called to, so they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I, no long, I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. So you see, Peter now is understanding the meaning of the trance that he had with the animals. God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean, as he would normally think of the Gentiles and not associate with them. And that's what he's telling them. You know, as a Jew, I should have no contact with you, but I am. Because God has shown me that his ways are profoundly different than I thought they were. I should call no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, four days ago, I was praying in my house about the same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the, the home of Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Again, as I said earlier, do you see the humility that Cornelius has? We are waiting for you to give us the message God has for you, has for us. What is the message that God has for Cornelius? Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Now, if the text stopped there, what would we conclude? We would conclude that there are people in every nation, not just Jews, not just a particular group of people, that God accepts those who fear him and do what is right. So it seems like if you stop here, that the message that God has for Cornelius through Peter is to say, you are accepted. You are accepted by God because you are a fearer, you fear God, and you do what is right. So we might conclude, as many say today, that this really is the gospel, this really is the good news, that Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, even moral humanists, 
God accepts them. Those who are God-fearers and do what is right. So is faith in Christ necessary? No, it doesn't seem so. As long as you are a God-fearer and you do what is right. God accepts people from everywhere. But the text doesn't stop there. Peter goes on and says this. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, but now for you also, because God should, is not, does not take favorites. This is the good message for you now also, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. There is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now, why is this good news? Because doesn't Cornelius, as I say here, doesn't he already have peace with God? He is a devout man, we're told in the text. He prays, he does good things. His prayer and his good deeds are accepted by God as an offering. So what does he, why is this good news to him? Because it seems as if, it doesn't seem as if, there, there is no peace with God except through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. If, if it was true that there was peace through, with God through religion, through fe just fearing God and doing what is right, then Peter would have said to them, here is the good news. You are accepted by God. You have peace with God. You know that. You're a devout person. You have peace with God. And we have many, 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 many people around us, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, moral humanists, who at some level fear God and, and do good things. And we would, would you say they have peace with God? Aren't we to coexist? Isn't it all equal? Does it really matter? What we should really gather together, as I heard one evangelical uh, saying this, you know, we are in the, the real battle today is between the secularists, those who deny that there is any God, and those who believe that there is some kind of God. And all religions who believe that there is some kind of God should come together under one umbrella to oppose the secular world that says there is no God. This is the common bond that we have that make us one now. That we believe that there is a God. That's where the division line falls. As long as you believe that there is a God, we are in one camp together against those who say there is no God and want to get rid of God from everything. But again... It's interesting that in the text, there's an emphasis on Cornelius was a righteous and devout man, a God-fearer. The angel even says the things that he has done has been accepted by God. So why does he need this, this additional message <laughs> that is telling him, you currently do not have peace with God because peace with God comes only through Jesus Christ, whom you do not know. And the answer is, at least according, it seems like according to the text is, because there is no peace with God except through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And that's why it's good news. Because the only way you can have peace with God is through Jesus Christ, who is Lord 
not just of some, who is Lord of all. Okay, let's go on in the text. You know what? So now, now, now watch. Now Peter is going to say, um, it's very important that you know about Jesus Christ. And notice how in the text, and that's what we have here, what he says to these people is to explain what is most important about Jesus. He says nothing about his moral teachings, uh, but uh, the, the issue is that he is God's anointed one. He is God's Messiah. And we know this because, and you'll see Peter saying this, because of how he lived, how he died, and how this was in accord with the scriptures. So you see, what is most important is not what works for you, what seems good to you, what kind of God or religion or Jesus, but what is the truth? Is this Jesus God's Messiah? Is he the Christ? And so that's what Paul said, or that's what Peter is saying here. I want to assure you that he is, in fact, the Christ. Now, again, most of the people I, we interact with, if you're going to talk about God or about Jesus or whatever, it, it, you know, and, it, and if you said the things that Peter say, well, people would say, well, I don't care about that. I really don't care about these fulfillment of prophecies and things. All that I care about is really, does he work for me? What will he do for me? Does it seem good to me? So sell him to me experientially. What is going to happen right now? How is he going to change? Or what is he going to do for me right now? I don't really care <laughs> whether it's true or not. Spin a good yarn. Tell me a good story. That's what matters. That I can live my life by. So Peter says this. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. That's John the Baptist, remember? And you know that God anointed. So he, these people are aware of these things that have gone on. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Also, I want to emphasize, you see, he is a real man. This is not a myth or a story. Here's the emphasis. He is a real guy. This guy, Jesus, from Nazareth, God has anointed him. Um, with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses, eyewitnesses. We, that which John in his uh, first letter, 1 John chapter 1, I always uh, have appreciated how John says, that which we have seen, that which we have touched, that which we have heard, we were with Jesus. That's what we are testifying to. The reality of that. Fact. You know, people, uh, I see that sign, we believe that science is real. The facts are real. You know who's concerned about facts and reality? Look at the gospel. Look at the biblical text. That's what you see in Acts. That's what you see in the epistles. We want to verify that this is not a myth or a story. These things really happened. So we and we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him, why is that important? Third, fulfillment of prophecy. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We are those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify 
that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge over all. This message is not just for the Jews. This message is for everyone. He has commanded us to preach everywhere. And it is not only just for everyone, it is necessary for everyone. Because peace with God is only available through Jesus Christ. That's why he has ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify because Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all. Now, isn't the living and the dead? Now, isn't it interesting that that is what is pointed out here? And instead of, you know, what we might like or would expect, what else would you expect? Jesus is the one appointed by God, what? To be the savior, to be the lover of our souls, to be our friend, to be our shepherd. To be a host of other things. Why is it that the focus is on he is the judge? <laughs> you know, I bet if, if I gave you a, I, I said, here's a sheet of paper with pen and paper or whatever. Write down 10 titles that you know of Jesus Christ that would describe him. Would you have put he is the judge? I can tell you I would not have put that. I rarely think of him as the judge. But here Peter, of all the things, singles out, he is the one anointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Again, you see this message would be inappropriate or we would consider it ineffective today because nobody wants to hear of Jesus as the judge. And we don't really believe in sin anymore and a judgment anymore. So it is, you know, it's just, it would just be um, just completely out of context to refer to Jesus primarily as the judge. Singly as the judge here. He is the judge of all, the living and the dead. Apparently, that is something that is on the minds of and the hearts of the people to whom Peter is speaking. And this feeds into, as we'll see, why peace with God is, is an issue. So he is appointed as judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Again, here we see the, the, the context of him being judged and judged, and that makes sense that then he would say that in Christ alone, the ones who believe in him, they will have their sins forgiven through his name. Because he is the judge. The issue is my sins. What about my sins with God? Now, going back to what Peter said before, you see it there. Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. So based upon what we have now in this account, what does it mean to fear him and to do what is right? Well, with this additional information, this additional preaching of Peter, to fear him is what? Is to long for or to desire peace with God. And that comes from a realization that I, am, I'm, I'm, I have sin. I'm estranged from God. I'm separated from God. So even though I am religious or devout, as Cornelius was, I want to suggest to you that there is still this realization, this longing, this fear of God in Cornelius that knows 
that all of my self-righteousness and religious practices are not enough to please God. What is on his heart and mind is the good news that Peter is bringing, that God has brought to Cornelius through Peter, that there is peace with God, real peace with God, forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, who is the judge of all and the Savior. And to do what is right is to respond to this message, to recognize that Jesus is God's Messiah and to believe in him, to embrace him. In every nation, he accepts those who have this hunger for God, who recognize their own sin, who have no peace with God, and know that they are accountable to him. And then who do what is right when they hear the gospel, as they reach out to God, God brings them the knowledge of the gospel of life, of peace with God through Jesus Christ. They respond to that and believe. In every nation, there are those whom God will call to himself and fully accept those who fear him and do what is right. Let's go on with the text. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed. Remember when Peter left to go to Joppa, he took some believers, some other believers with him, perhaps as witnesses, perhaps he didn't know if this was some kind of trap and he wanted some support, but he had taken others with him. That's what's referred to here. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. So you see in this whole uh, account, right, the emphasis is on here their realization that the gospel and Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews, but for all people. They were amazed. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God, just as they, the apostles had experienced on the day of Pentecost. It's interesting. Their concern was not, did, they make, did these people make a profession of faith? Did these people pray to receive Jesus Christ? What was their concern? Their concern was, was there evidence from God that they were really his children, that they belonged to him. What was important was God's stamp of approval, the Holy Spirit. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked them to stay with them for several days. Now let's go on into chapter 11 and notice the reaction of some of the other people and some of the things that are said about what happened. Soon the news reached the apostles and the other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Another parallel phrase they believed in Jesus here it says they received the word of God they embraced the expressed will of God in Jesus Christ but when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem the Jewish believers criticized him you entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them they said now you see I re I made a reference to this earlier when I said, well, if I was a Jew and a friend of Peter's and Peter came to me and said, God told me he's accepting the Gentiles. I would have said like these people, 
but, but that is not God. And they call him on the carpet because according to the expressed will of God, as they know it, Peter should not have gone into that house. Peter should have nothing to do with Gentiles. So they, they criticized him for that. Let's go on. Then Peter told them exactly what had happened. And in the text, Peter, the text goes through just the same details that we had earlier about how Peter had this vision. God put down this um, tablecloth, had these animals, and said to him, Do not, these are clean, do not call what I call clean unclean. So Peter, all of that is in the text here. We'll move on. So he, Cornelius, told us how an angel had told him, send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He will tell you and how, he will tell you how you and everyone in your household can be saved. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? When the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. So what happened to Cornelius through the preaching of this message according to the, <coughs> the text that we just see here in chapter 11? He received the word of God. He was saved. He was told how to be saved and he was saved. He was given and he took the privilege of repenting. I love that phrase, the privilege of repenting. Now, what does it mean to repent? It is not just to feel sorrow for sins. Oh, I made a mess of my life. Oh, I've done terrible things before God. I feel really bad about those things. I've hurt a lot of people. That is not repentance. That may be sorrow for sins. Sorrow for the things you have suffered or you, in, you put upon other people, the suffering you caused. But repentance is turning from and turning to. It's turning from our sin and turning to God. That's what repentance is. You can be sorry for sin and you can even turn away from sin but not repent. Repentance is turning from sin and turning to God. And that is considered not bad news, not something terrible, but the privilege of repenting. The privilege of repenting. They believed, they received the Holy Spirit, and they received life of an eternal quality. Eternal life. So here again, we're told that Cornelius was a devout, God-fearing man who was generous. He gave to the poor. He was a good man. He prayed. He was a very religious man. And he was accepted and noticed by God. So why did he need anything more? The message was that in every nation, God accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And this, this interaction between Peter and Cornelius has, has for men, a long time always reminded me of uh, a passage in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 talks all about faith in God. It starts out by defining, you know, faith is the things not seen, the things that are hoped for. And then it talks about, uh, it's a lengthy chapter, about all of uh, God's people who lived by faith. 
That is, they didn't just they didn't just say they believed, they lived it. They lived as if it's really true. They lived as if the things they said they believed were really true. And they were willing to die for their, uh, what they believed. They were willing to leave their country for their faith. They, were, they served God wholeheartedly. Because they believed that the things that they said were really true. Now in verse 6 of that uh, chapter, I, I, just, I have mentioned this many a time. If you're not familiar with this verse, it is, is so critical where it says, For without faith it is impossible to please God. And then it gives us two elements to the nature of it. First of all, you must believe that God exists. And secondly, that he is a rewarder, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He rewards those who earnestly seek him or who sincerely seek him here. God will respond to anyone who sincerely or earnestly is seeking. This is foundational in one's relationship with God. If you do not believe, oops, I clicked accidentally. If you do not believe that God responds to those who earnestly seek him, then there is, there is no faith there is, and you're not going to. Sometimes there's, you know, there's, there, there is an, uh, uh, technically speaking, an atheist is a person who says there is no God. What is an agnostic? Technically, an agnostic says, I don't know. I don't say that there isn't a God. I don't say that there is a God. I just don't know. So I'm not, I, I'm not on either extreme. The atheist says, I know for sure there is no God. And the believer, the Christian, let's say, says, I know for sure there is a God. In between is the agnostic, supposedly, who says, well, I don't really know. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm not saying there is. Sometimes that's seen as an enlightened position, right? <laughs> I don't really know. Many of the people I interact with are in that agnostic category. They're not, although there's, I think there's increasingly more people who are um, militant and are very willing to say, I know that there is no God, which is, if you think about it, is quite an arrogant statement to say, I absolutely know that there is no God. Um, but but there's increasingly people who would say that. But it used to be more common that people would be agnostic. They would just say, well, I don't know. That made no sense to me. If there was a possibility that there is a God, if there was a possibility that what Christians say is true, then it seems to me you would have to make a concerted effort to find out if, in fact, it really is true to the best of your ability. You would not be content with saying, well, I don't know, maybe it is, and doing nothing. God will respond to those who earnestly seek him. I've, I've thought about this a lot. Now, when you... When you think about what happened on 9-11 and these 19 terrorist hijackers, murderers, who flew these planes into these, well, killed all of these people, right? I suspect, and, and when, they've, when they have had um, you know, terrorist incidents, if you've ever seen them, you know, uh, most frequently, uh, just before they, a, a person blows themselves up or flies a plane into a tower to kill, they, they, the last thing they, that comes out of their mouth is, Allahu Akbar, God is great. God is great. Here are, here's a young man who is willing to blow himself up, to kill himself, 
seemingly horribly misguided, but seemingly so sincere and earnest that he is willing to die in service to God. What he believes is serving God. Would you say that a a 14-year-old boy who's a devout Muslim who's willing to take a grenade and walk into a group of people and pull that pin is sincere, is an earnest seeker of God? Am I an earnest seeker? Here is somebody who's willing to kill themselves because of what they believe about God. And I can hardly crack my Bible on a Sunday afternoon because, well, (laughs) I'm just really tired. (laughs) Maybe tomorrow. Aren't they earnest seekers? Doesn't God reward those who earnestly seek him? And, And my response to you is to say, As hard as it is to say, to believe, I have to question whether they're earnest seekers. Because what is fundamental about God is this. He does not show favoritism. And if you earnestly seek him, if you sincerely seek him, he will get the truth to you. He will reward that. How do I know that? I see that happening with how he treats Cornelius. He goes out of his way, God does, miraculously, to get the truth to reward Cornelius because he is an earnest seeker. Now, one thing I don't know how to respond is why should I be a Christian? Why did the truth, why did he get the truth to me? Because I can tell you, I was not an earnest seeker. That is a mystery to me. But to those who earnestly seek, God will reward them. That's what you see here. He brings them the message of peace with God through Jesus Christ. What did Cornelius have to gain? We're almost done. What did Cornelius have to gain? You see, most of the people we interact with in our culture see Christianity as a religion to be practiced. And that's why most people think, it seems like, that one religion is just as good as another. And all that matters is what you feel comfortable with, how you were raised, whatever you like. There's no real such thing as truth in religion. It's just flavors of religion. Whatever works for you. So if that is true, if Cornelius was a fine, upstanding, devout, good guy, then what did he have to gain by Peter coming to him and saying, no, you need to believe in Jesus Christ? What experientially did he have to gain? And the answer is this. God was not, God is not content with a religious relationship with you. And I don't think Cornelius was content with that either. He was thirsting for more, just as God is thirsting for more with us. What does, what does peace with God look like? What does peace with God look like? Does it look like you just get a, you get a statement, some like a baptismal certificate, a certificate of faith in Jesus Christ? And so I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Wow, I have peace now. 
Does it mean, does peace with God mean, oh, I felt like there was so such a heavy load of sin on me, but now I, that load is taken off, Jesus Christ has taken off that load of sin, and now I, I feel like I have peace with God. I've always felt like he's just mad at me and irritated with me, but whew, now he'll tolerate me, <laughs> and I have peace with him. Let me just close with two very familiar Christmas texts to answer this question. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. What is the peace that's referred to here. Is it military peace? Is it emotional peace? Is it relational peace between people? Jesus, the love of Jesus just spreads. That's what it is. And we'll have peace on earth. No, it's, it's qualified, isn't it? It's a peace that comes from having God's favor rest upon you. And that favor, as we know, comes through his son, Jesus Christ. Last one. All this took place, the birth of Jesus, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means... God with us. What does peace with God look like? It looks like that. It looks like God with me. God not in religion or a religious relationship, but God with me. His name is Emmanuel because he will be God with you.